Thanks. Thanks a lot, Julia. And thanks, everybody, for, for joining. As Julia mentioned, I'm just going to begin by giving an overview of our sixth carbon budget pathway and the investments needed to achieve that. And then I'll pass over to Nick to talk about a bit more in depth about the Road to Net Zero Finance report. Um, so in 2019, the UK committed itself to net zero emissions by 2050. And this pathway represents a real scaling up of ambition and a decisive transition for the UK. To put that into context, you can see on this slide, first in black, historic emissions reductions in the UK, decreasing about 40% since 1990. And then the dotted purple line here, which is our sixth carbon budget pathway. And you can see that it not only maintains the speed of decarbonisation, it actually accelerates. In, in yellow, you can see the actual sixth carbon budget um, recommendation we're making, and that's a nearly 80% reduction in emissions by 2035. And to put into context how ambitious this is, 18 months ago, the UK's 2050 target was an 80% reduction. So we're bringing forward that ambition by 50 years. Now, to achieve this, we're going to need a host of measures. So this slide is our rainbow of abatement, and you can see it falls into four broad categories. At the top, we have reducing demand and energy efficiency. So this is measures such as switching to public transport, but also the rollout of more electrically efficient appliances. And in the middle, the, the oranges and yellows, this is the take up of low carbon solutions and um, most dominantly electrification. So this is your electric vehicles and your rollout of heat pumps. And all of this electrification is gonna require a scale up of, of low carbon energy, which is our, our light blue slice near the bottom. And this is not only a scale up of low carbon electricity, which, which more than doubles current day levels by 2050, it's also the development of a significant hydrogen economy. And then finally in green, offsetting is gonna be a part of this transition, both natural and through engineered removals. Now to achieve this, it's gonna require a major nationwide investment program. Um, starting first with the, the overall costs. And as Julia mentioned, the story here is, is more positive than we were saying in 2019. We previously thought that it would cost between one to 2% of GDP per year. And our sitcom budget pathway suggests that actually it's gonna be more like 0.5% and less than 1% of GDP throughout the entire transition. And we've updated our analysis here based us on real life price reductions, which have allowed us to, uh, to forecast a, a more cheap transition. But we actually think maybe a more intuitive way of understanding the investment story here is splitting out into investments and operational savings. So here what we're presenting is in-year additional capital investment in low carbon um, sectors. And you can see that it scales up almost fivefold from present day levels to around 50 billion by the late 2020s and maintains that level to 2050. Um, and for, for context, current capital formation is around 400 billion per year. So this is really a significant increase. However, the story doesn't end there. For this investment, you achieve significant operational savings, um, most dominantly in electrification of surface transport, which is then becomes cheaper to run and maintain. So that by delivering this additional capital investment, you achieve operational savings that by 2050, more than offset the in-year investment that we're seeing, which is a really positive story. And I think um, really puts the emphasis on cost of capital. So the, the final slide I'm gonna show here was some analysis we presented to the Net Zero Finance Group, which looked at in a world of really high certainty of exceptional policy, how low could cost of capital be? And that's the green sliver that you see here at the top. And contrasting that with a world with high levels of uncertainty, high levels of cost of capital and policy failure, you can see that it adds nearly 15 billion per year to the cost of the transition. So a crucial, um, a crucial role of this transition is ensuring that we get low cost of capital through high levels of certainty and through good policy. Now, that's a whistle-stop tour of the analysis that we presented to the, the finance group. Um, I'll now, and I'll pass over to Nick to talk about the, um, the musings that they had and the recommendations they had for the CCC on, on net zero finance. 
Well, thanks very much, Jake, and thanks uh, very much, uh, Julia, for, for hosting this. Um, so first, really, just to, to let you know um, who uh, was in the uh, advisory group, I was delighted to be asked to, to chair uh, the group. Um, we also had uh, Ben Caldicott from Oxford, Ingrid Holmes from Federated Hermes, uh, Andy, Andy Howard from Troders, Daniel Clear, HSBC, Rishi Madlani, uh, RBS NatWest, uh, my own colleague Roberta Pia Federici, uh, Ria Marie Thomas, and Steve Waygood from, uh, from Aviva. So a great uh, set of, uh, of, of insights. Um, and our task was really to look at the uh, role of finance in delivering not just the six carbon budget, obviously the road to net zero uh, overall in 2050. So just some sort of context, what's, what's the, the landscape look like? So we're, we're clearly seeing a lot of mainstream financial regulation about net zero and climate risk. But uh, the recognition that this pace needs to uh, accelerate. So the report that uh, we issued alongside the six carbon budget was commissioned by the CC to really look at how we finance net zero investment in the UK, complementing a lot of the work that is already going on about broader um, greening of uh, the financial system. Clearly, this was happening in the context of the crisis around COVID. But our view was that the COVID actually was deepening rather than deflecting commitment to net zero finance, particularly uh, with a focus on ensuring that we're channeling capital to a green uh, recovery. You've ha heard the, the core analysis uh, from, from Jake, uh, and I think maybe just to pull out again, this uh, really profound front loading of capital investment to hit our net zero targets, a fivefold uh, increase in capital investment this decade and then sustaining that um, uh, through the decades to come, obviously delivering huge uh, economic uh, savings, uh, but the, the crucial issue here about good policy, uh, good policy, good markets, uh, to ensure that the cost of capital is reduced. So our overall conclusion was that actually mobilizing that fivefold uh, increase and sustaining that was achievable, but we would need to confront uh, a series of financial obstacles that still uh, remain um, in the path of mobilizing uh, net zero finance. So we have market and policy failures, institutional gaps, particularly at the local level, uh, that's resulting in weak demand for net zero finance, uh, insufficient skills, I'm thinking more here uh, actually within the financial system, and data gaps. Um, not least actually what is the overall scale in terms of net zero finance and, and, and so on, as well as data at the operational level. Next slide. So in terms of actually how we came to the recommendations, which I'll run through in a minute, we developed this, uh, these five principles to sort of sum up our sort of analytical findings and also to frame the recommendations I'll run through. So firstly, there is a prize here that actually finance will flow, there is available capital, but we do need to think about uh, effective policy and market frameworks to do this. To do this also, we'll need to change our mindset in the financial system, um, shifting from just a focus on the risks of climate change to uh, alignment with net zero, but also uh, resilience in the just transition. This requires action both in the real economy, we need to have real economy policies pulling through and attracting the increased amount of capital we need at low cost, but also complementary measures within the financial system, making sure that financial policy and regulation is designed with net zero uh, in mind uh, and filling the gaps, the institutional gaps uh, to increase the efficiency of capital intermediation. Now, clearly this is not happening uh, in, in isolation. This needs to happen um, in terms of uh, thinking about the broader uh, frameworks, uh, global frameworks on net zero financing. Um, and, and we need to, the UK can play a really important role, not least this year in terms of co-creating those. So those are the, the principles. And I just want to run through the six uh, uh, sets of recommendations which acts as a package. The first is at a strategic level, that alongside our national goal of uh, uh, being a net zero economy, we really need to think about having a goal to have be a net zero financial system uh, and cascade this through market practices, through regulations and public uh, finance. Uh, second is this focus on making the net zero investments investable, uh, in pr predictability of cash flows, reducing risks, sector by sector transition pathways with finance inside, obviously good uh, carbon pricing mechanisms and as well as using public cap capital for de-risking. Then we need to make sure that these net zero uh, policies are connected uh, and joined up with other priorities, making sure they're fair, supported just transition, uh, also linked to our efforts on resilience and particularly enable local action uh, and delivery. 
So that's at the strategy level. Then in terms of private finance, this is going to need a whole lot of innovation from across uh, the financial markets. Uh, and we need to be thinking about sector specific tools, uh, but also system wide instruments, much more on what's called transition finance, sustainable uh, infrastructure, as well as place based finance. We also need to make sure that the 100,000 or so, um, sorry, 100,000 or so um, professionals in the, in, the, in, the, in the financial sector um, are also have the skills and capacity to support their clients uh, and, and customers across the sectors. Um, and uh, the Green Finance Education Charter is a really good place to do that. But also we need uh, confidence and expertise in terms of the users of finance, whether that's households, small businesses, uh, large corporates, or indeed the government, to actually demand, demand uh, climate aligned products and also uh, making sure that they're suited to their needs. So that's boosting financial literacy on sustainability net zero and also the transparency of products. So that's on private finance. Complementing that and ensuring that that is delivered is obviously focus on uh, financial regulation. Uh, and lots happening already here in the UK. Our recommendation is that we need to make sure that not just climate risk, but also net zero is incorporated into financial regulation and monetary policy. And a, and a particular focus on looking actually at the rules that we currently have, the stock of rules, which obviously were not designed with net zero in mind. So there might be some legacy issues that we need to uh, address. Then a recommendation that to drive this through, we need uh, net zero plans and targets to be mandatory for financial institutions uh, to really show uh, how banks and investors and others are making their portfolios consistent with the net zero goal. Stewardship by investors, a key lever for this, uh, and, and making sure that this incorporates net zero to ensure that the earnings that are retained by businesses um, are also uh, aligned. And finally, obviously, this all needs very, very clear metrics. A lot of work on this, um, but really important to ensure that there is clarity on this and great potential with the new green taxonomy, which the Chancellor has announced at the end of last year. So financial regulation, uh, the, 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 the third pillar. Fourth, public finance. Clearly, uh, absolutely uh, important. Uh, many, much of the uh, initial work will need uh, support from, uh, from the government. Um, and notably, in terms of the fiscal uh, stimulus, in terms of green uh, recovery plans, obviously, a lot going on uh, in terms of that, um, but also a large potential uh, through the issuance of a series of green sovereign bonds from the government um, to also catalyze broader markets in this uh, recovery phase. Then also we need to think as well as that, that, that fiscal support, also thinking about the role of public finance institutions, making sure net zero is uh, right at the heart of, of the mission and practice of key existing institutions, British Business Bank for small business and UK export finance. And then obviously we have this new national infrastructure bank uh, and important that this has net zero and sustainability at the heart and also is really geared to support um, local delivery and crowding private capital. So public finance. Then uh, mentioned earlier, obviously, the international dimension uh, and the important role that the UK can play in shaping those international uh, frameworks, particularly this year, president of both the G7 group and obviously also the COP26 summit uh, in Glasgow later in this year. So a few things that we, we, we suggested in the, in the report, um, really using the UK's role to build that coalition of countries committing to net zero financial reform, see how to mobilize finance for a green recovery, potentially through a coordinated issuance of green sovereign bonds, and then also a, uh, encouraging the establishment of an international platform for climate finance, really to bridge global finance gaps in developing and emerging economies. And then one more uh, recommendation, really the final one, all of this, uh, if we're going to deliver this scale up of capital, we need to have good data sets um, at, the, at the national level, sector level, and so on. So our recommendations, we have a regular assessment of both the investment needs, uh, which we've heard about today, but also though tracking those financial flows so we can assess how we are doing in terms of net zero uh, resilience and just transition. So that's, a, again, another whistle stops tour and back to you, uh, Julia, for, for the panel. Thank you.